Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast. My name is Sully and with me today I have Austin. Hi there. And also with us today we have a, an incredibly special guest. We have with us probably one of the researchers and lecturers and scholars that has done more for the Anglophone anime community than anybody else ha had basically created the UK anime uh, fandom community from scratch and has written several acclaimed books on uh, anime and anime directors and anime scholarship. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us today from the UK, we have Helen McCarthy with us. Hello, it's lovely to be here. And it's going to be very difficult for me to sort of interview Helen because this is trying to condense a career that has spanned almost 40 years into about an hour-long podcast, but we really are lucky to have Helen because it is impossible to do any sort of academic or scholarly work on anime without referring to her work in one way or the other. You are going to probably touch upon it. And for most people, probably me and Austin's age, you probably know Helen best because she co-authored with Jonathan Clements the Anime Encyclopedia, which as of 2015 went into its third edition and it is an absolute doorstopper. <laughs> yes. Funny, it's funny. actually the perfect murder weapon if you want something you can conceive easily on a bookshelf. <laughs> funny thing, my first interaction with the anime encyclopedia was actually at a trivia contest in, um, I think it was, it's a convention in our area that no longer exists anymore. I believe it's called Hoshikan, and they were giving away anime books as prizes for the trivia contest and I won and got a copy of the anime encyclopedia and sadly many years ago I had to part ways with it and I now regret that. Oh well a new one you can get on Kindle and it's fully searchable as an ebook which given that it's now 1,100,000 words long with multiple entries fully searchable on ebook is a huge advantage take it if you can get it. Yeah that sounds like a much better alternative anyway. Mm. I know that the university me and Austin go to actually has an ebook copy of the latest edition, and I have used it. I have my 2001 first edition on my bookshelf, but that's uh, a little out of date now because there are so many more titles that have come out since 2001, and you have actually taken the trouble to catalog all of them. That is uh, 20 years, or at least about 14 years worth of titles that have come out between that first edition and the current edition that's out now, and... Uh, I, I believe you've mentioned before you are interested in adding on and making a fourth edition. Oh, very, very much so. The problems that we have are twofold. One, obviously, is that a fourth edition will be an enormous amount of work. It'll require Jonathan and I to commit between um, two and three years of prep time and our publisher to commit to an enormous amount of expense. And the other is that we are actually, as of the third edition, at the limits of binding technology. We can't actually bind a book that's any bigger than the book that we have. So we're looking at, um, do we go all ebook? A lot of universities, a lot of colleges, a lot of film schools like a physical book for the shelf. So, and, and that's obviously a big market. So do we go to volume? Do we separate out, for example, one thing we've discussed is separating out all the erotica into a single volume and doing a parental guidance version and a clean version. So you can buy the set, or if you're a concerned parent who doesn't want your child reading about hentai, you can just buy everything else. And if you're a nerd, you can just buy hentai if that's the way your nerddom goes. Uh, but it, it, it is very difficult. The, the problem with something like this is that this book doesn't really... It's not really Jonathan's and my book. It is because it was our creation. But so many other people, our wonderful beta readers, the team at Stonebridge, everybody we get information from, has put into it. And as the book gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more and more like one of those enormous starships that's too big to land. It's, it's the Nostromo. It has to park in orbit around some world. And it gets more and more difficult to add more to it the longer you go on. So Jonathan and I are definitely up for revising it. We're always up for revising it. But our, our secret dream is that some billionaire with with an enormous income and, and lots of money to spare will fund a unit 
to keep it updated constantly and bring out revisions every couple of years. And Jeff Bezos, if you're listening, we are up to doing a deal. You know, don't 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 be shy. Just call us and ask us if we could set up an anime encyclopedia unit anywhere in the world. We have great staff that we could put on board on a contract basis. We have great contacts that we could use. But it's it's got to a stage where it's like the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's it's beyond now two people to deal with and one publisher to deal with. It actually needs its own dedicated team of festival floats to keep it moving on. So watch this space. We may be able to get a fourth edition out. We certainly love to get a fourth edition out, but it's it's beginning to get to the stage where it needs serious money behind it. And one thing I want to point out to people, because a lot of people, again, me and Austin's age, who I talk about, and I've mentioned the anime encyclopedia to them, they think, well, why do people even use physical encyclopedias anymore? But it's probably the most well-researched uh, book on anime as a general concept that's available, and you used a great deal of first sort like primary sources in Japanese and had Japanese contributors which gives the level of accuracy that most online sources or uh, fan sources that are kind of done from people who don't have those kind of contacts do not have access to. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. I think it takes a scholar to notice something like that because, of course, for the general reader, and we do try and write for the, the intelligent general reader, as Jonathan always says, you're just reading this stuff for a scholar. You've done that kind of work. You know what it takes to get it there, and you check back on the footnotes. But... One, one of the things that I, I think is most challenging to me about public attitudes to the encyclopedia is that we get, we get loads of haters on the internet. You know, everybody gets haters on the internet. If you don't, you're not doing it properly. But they come on and say, this book is useless. Why would anybody bother with it anymore? And two weeks after the next edition comes out, they've all updated their websites with stuff that wasn't in there before we published it in the new edition of the encyclopedia. That was so conspicuous in 2015. Jonathan and I were kind of laying little bets with each other as to how quickly we could see new information go on to various fan websites that had dissed us. And unfortunately, we were both right on the money every time. Um, <laughs> I think our value really comes from our cross-cultural perspective, though, because a lot of people who have the book in Japan, and a remarkable number of companies and libraries have it in Japan, have said to us, well, I didn't know that this British company or this American novel or this particular connection existed till I saw it in the anime encyclopedia. So we can bring a perspective to it from both lived experience and scholarly experience that bridges the world. And that's what we wanted to do. That's all we ever really wanted to do was make a book about anime that would say this is not some crazy, funky kids thing. It's not some fad. It's not Saturday morning TV. This is a real, live, cultural medium, and you have to treat it with the respect it deserves. Is there a Japanese analog for the anime encyclopedia? There is no analog for the anime encyclopedia anywhere in the world, and I include the whole of the internet. Wow. Yeah, because I would assume that probably the most the I, probably the most popular encyclopedic sources for anime specifically would be something like My Anime List or the uh, Anime News Network Encyclopedia, and I would assume that probably the bedrocks of both of those things f come from your work. Well, actually, no, it, to, be, to be fair, ANN was doing that sort of work before we brought out the encyclopedia. And there are, there are a lot of websites that were in protean form that were coming to be before we brought out the encyclopedia um, because they couldn't really expand until broadband became more widespread and more available. They didn't have the, the audience. And it's astonishing in Almost every area related to most popular culture, technology leads. Technology leads all the time, whether it's the transport technology that let the carnies and the shows go all over newly opened American territories, or whether it's the video technology that let Japanese people and then people all over the world start recording 
off TV and building their own libraries. Technology is the main leader. And so there are websites out there that did the kind of work that we were doing, although not on the level that we were doing it or to the scale that we were doing it brilliantly and really well and were pretty largely unsung. And ANN has, has, has kind of hung in there. And we have a lot of respect for the team at ANN and uh, for the kind of work that they do. But we just have a totally different perspective because the, the other thing we do, which we share with ANN, is that we are very personal. We don't believe in detachment. This is culture. How do you detach yourself from your culture? You mm -hmm. can't do that unless you're an anthropologist studying something dead. So we do snark, we do sarcasm, we do passionate like and dislike. We try to be fair as far as we can, but we also have to be rigorous. And some of the, the most entertaining responses we get are from people who jump up and down and scream and chew the, the wallpaper and say, I can't believe you were so unfair to my favorite anime. <laughs> to which my answer is usually, well, I've seen your favorite anime 15 times before over the past 30 years under different names. You wait and you've done that and then see how fair you can be to it. That's a great thing that you point out about, about ANN and how personal they make it. And I think that was something that was really reinforced by the late Zach Birchie, who I never met personally, but was a huge inspiration on me as sort of a, a person in the anime space. And his whole approach to being the executive executive editor or director of uh, Anime News Network really, really fostered that that sort of culture of approaching approaching anime seriously, but not being afraid to make it personal and really talk about, you know, how it hits you like in your heart. And that's something that I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, replicate um, throughout my being a fan, because I think that's a really cool way to approach it. It's very cool. Absolutely. I, I, I didn't know Zach well, but mm -hmm. I know how much he is loved and how well he is missed. And yeah. I think that thing about bringing your heart to it and having no shame, because why should we be ashamed of love, whatever we love? Why should we be ashamed of love? Why should we be ashamed of passion? Why should we be ashamed or afraid to admit that something fires our heart and makes us want to talk about it and laugh about it and sing about it and share it? To me, not to be passionate about anime and open about it, not to be out as a fan, is like not being passionate about Rembrandt. And I adore Rembrandt. Michelangelo perhaps a shade better, but I adore Rembrandt. I go and visit Rembrandt every year on my birthday in the National Gallery. We have one of his late self-portraits there. And ever since I was in my teens and came down to London summers for the National Youth Theatre, I've been going there and sitting with him for a while and just looking at this old guy in his 60s then, poor after having been very rich, son dead, wife dead, most of his friends dying, just looking out of the picture. And for me being this chippy little Irish kid going to take on the world, now being a woman who's older than he was when he passed, and looking at him and saying, yeah, I think I'm kind of getting to a state where I might be growing into you now. It's, it's remarkable, and I love that. I'm passionate about it. I adore it. And I love anime just as much, and anime has given me many similar experiences where I've grown with a show over the years, and I've seen depths to a show over the years that I didn't see when I first saw it. Gundam, the first two series of Gundam, still break my heart. Shah's Counter-Attack is a big, flawed, zonky film. But at the end of it, where they do the whole Arthurian thing, that has me in tears every time. Legend of Galactic Heroes, every time I rewatch Legend of Galactic Heroes, any of the segments, I learn more. How can we not be passionate? If you're not passionate, you're not alive. I think that's such an interesting point to make because what I see a lot of in younger fandom is this ironic detachment, this uh, sort of, oh, what I like is dumb, you know, I like trash. And I, I think it's so unfortunate because... I think it's an entire generation that has been conditioned to think that the things that they care about are pointless. And I was reading, I was recently reading a book by Maitland McDonough, who's a film critic, and she had a chapter introducing, um, then this was a book on Daria Argento, she was talking about how film directors often, if they're working in a genre, 
uh, genre piece, you know, like horror, a, a science fiction adventure, that they will say, oh, well, this is not a horror movie. I think it's above a horror movie. It's not quite. And it's because they don't want to face the backlash of working in a, in a genre film. And I kind of think it's the same way with a lot of younger fans now. They've been told by teachers by artists, by their parents, that what they like and is frivolous. And other people on the internet. And other people on the internet. And sadly, even people who are into the same things they are, that what they care about is frivolous or immature or not worth being passionate about, or that passion is a weakness. And to have someone who has done all the things you have done say, no, this is what you need, I think is very important. Yeah, and I, I think scholarship has a duty to inculcate rigor alongside passion to say, yeah, you can say that what you love is dumb, providing you've analyzed it and looked at other examples and say, relative to this, this is dumb. Relative to Rembrandt, this artist is not on the same level of skill or humanity. But you can't just say it's dumb and leave it at that, or it's great and leave it at that. You have to be able to think through your passion. There are reasons why you love a person. And if the reasons why you love a person are just, oh, God, they're so hot, or oh, God, they're so cute, that will fall by the wayside in time. But if the reasons why you love a person are, this person engages with everything I am and do and makes me better, then you've got something that's worth staying with. We have to get, as scholars, we have to get the people we teach, the people we write to, the people we work with, to engage with passion and rigor in equal measure. And if we do that, then we really will have done a service to the world, whatever field we're in. So, Helen, you, again, have been in the anime fandom since 1981. How did you, I mean, I know this is a tale you've probably told several thousand times, but how did you enter into the anime fandom? What is your anime origin story? Well, it is a tale I love to tell however many times I can tell it, because it's not only my odyssey in anime, but it's also the place where I met my love, um one of my loves, because we all have many loves in our lives, but but but, but my, my, my partner, the person who has done more than anyone else to keep me honest and engaged throughout my life, um, we met not as a result of anime, but we bonded over anime. My other half, Steve Kite, is an illustrator, and the year that he graduated, he came to see my best friend's flatmate about doing some artwork for a convention devoted to the works of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, Thunderbirds, Stingray, Supercar, you know, the Super Marionation people. I was really into Super Marionation, and so was my friend Barbara and her flatmate Pam, and we were putting together this convention because we didn't think that the works of, of the Andersons were celebrated enough. And these five young guys, straight out of art school, all crazy about British 60s TV, wanted to come and show us their artwork and say, let us illustrate and do the covers for your convention book. So I opened the door very early on a Saturday morning. And this was most unnatural for Steve, who does not normally become conscious before 11 a.m., even if he's walking and moving. <laughs> I opened the door because I was the only one in the flat who was awake at the time, because both Barbara and Pam also don't become conscious before 11 a.m. So these five guys stood there and looked at me much shorter than any of them and said, uh, we've come here to see Pam Barnes and Barbara Kitson about a, a convention. And I said, yeah, come in and made them coffee and went off and left them to have their meeting. And when Barbara emerged from the meeting, I said, you know, five single guys. And she said, yeah, because you check that kind of thing when you're you know, in our position as single girls. Don't you think we should kind of put them on our party list? Because, you know, five extra guys, always useful. She said, yeah, fine. I then walked into the front end of a moving forward Cortina. Not immediately. There was a gap of time and, and circumstance. And uh, broke my pelvis in five places and detached my pubic bone. So there was oh, no. some delay in executing my evil romantic vision. 
But eventually, Steve and I, I healed and Steve and I did get together. And I went around to his place for the obligatory meet my mom and dad thing that, you know, we all do at some time with our partners unless we're very, very fortunate. His mom and dad were actually quite lovely. And he showed me his room. And I saw this stack of books with the most amazing colorful covers and this fantastic little collection of three or four plastic robots ranging in height from three feet all the way down to six inches. And I said, what are they? And he said, oh, we, we got these. Um, I went, you know, the guys and I went on a graduation trip last year and we got these in Spain. They'd gone to Mallorca, which is a Spanish offshore island. And they, he said, these are all about Japanese cartoons and comics. And they have them in Spain, but in Spanish. Have you ever seen them before? I was blown away. I mean, I didn't read any Spanish. And I knew nothing about anime and manga, although it later turned out I had seen some anime on the BBC. Um, we had Marine Boy which is an amalgam of two Japanese series. But of course, nobody knew it was anime at the time. Nobody knew it was Japanese. It was dubbed into American. We all thought you guys made it at first. Um, and Steve showed me these things, which were Mazinger Z artifacts as it happened, and said, this is incredible. Tell me what you see in that comic book. And I said, I don't read Spanish. And he said, no. And I said, I can tell you what this is about. I can tell you this story. Let me take it home with me and I'll give you the story later on. Because I could read the narrative from the line. Now, to me, as someone who loves story and loves story structure and is a glutton for narrative, this was incredible. This was a way of presenting stories that didn't rely on me being verbal at all or didn't rely on me being particularly intellectual or particularly intelligent or particularly good in any language. I could read the story. I could communicate with anyone who could look at that page. This was this blew my mind wide open. And so I said to Steve, well, there's, there's got to be more of this stuff. Where is, where is it? He said, well, there's been some in France as well. So I went off to, because I went to a French convent school. So I went off to check with some of my, my, my colleagues who went to France regularly. And yes, there was a lot of Japanese animation available in French on French TV, in French comic books in translation. There was even a whole magazine, Club Dorothée, devoted to a Saturday morning TV show that ran six or seven anime segments on a Saturday morning. This was epic. You know, it was unbelievable to find all this. So then I went to do some research in English. Now, at the time, I was working for our national library, the British Library, which is like your Library of Congress, only quite a bit older. And um, there wasn't anything. There wasn't anything on Japanese animation at all. So I got out a couple of world encyclopedias of animation, which were mostly written in America and mostly focused on American animation and European art house animation. And most of them had like three lines somewhere saying Japanese animation, mostly Saturday kiddie, kiddie stuff, really, you know, not worth your attention. Apart from a couple of guys like this guy Tezuka who does some art house animation occasionally that's worth looking at, but really don't waste your time on Japanese animation. And by now I was chewing the, the furniture and screaming and jumping up and down in rage because I knew that something that could tell stories so beautifully, visually, was worth more attention than that. So I said, nobody has written a book about Japanese animation, Steve. I think I'm going to do it. Now, by this time, we've been going out for about a year and we were serious about each other. We, we knew that this was going the distance. And he said, really? in that way he has when I do something really stupid. And I said, yeah, because there has to be a book. Otherwise I won't know anymore and nobody else is writing it. So I'd better write it. So I spent the next 12 years persuading somebody to publish my first book and it was a hell of a slog, but we got there in 1993. But in order to do it, to backtrack a little, we had to, as you said, bootstrap a fandom. Now, there were other people who knew about anime in Britain because there were other people who'd been to um, Spain, to France, and a couple of people who'd been to America and had seen it there. Because, of course, the Japanese communities and the Hawaiian community in America had Japanese animation, sometimes translated so that second and third generation Japanese could understand it through subtitles. So anime was around. 
there were also a lot of Americans, including many Star Trek and science fiction fans in my circle, because I was a Trekkie too, who had done military service and had been to Japan or had friends who'd been to Japan and therefore had been able to get hold of Japanese animation on video. And there were also a number of these well-to-do young people, because as you know, people who are on military service overseas get pretty good allowances and they also get access to technology. And there are a lot of people in universities and other institutions who could get access to technology. People were beginning to copy these tapes and share them. And so we could get access. And as a result of that, I was able to pitch a Japanese animation program to a convention that I was working on. And they agreed to hold it. And it just so happened that that convention happened in the year that Akira had its British premiere. So suddenly, everybody wanted to know more about anime. And there we were. We were a group of fans. We had a newsletter. We turned the newsletter into a, a professional magazine through some investment that we got. We were experts. You know, We were suddenly experts by virtue of being the only people in the United Kingdom who knew how to pronounce the word anime, let alone you know, knew anything about it. And that meant that I got the in to do my book. So long, long story. And, and as you've gathered, I love to tell it. Because as an origin myth, I think it's pretty good. <laughs> and also, it just captures for, for fans now how different things were for everybody, American and British fans, when we started out in the 80s and 90s. You were living in an age in which you did not own a telephone. You didn't have a mobile phone of your own. You didn't have a mobile device of your own. Maybe you knew somebody who had a phone the size of a brick from the mid-80s onwards, but it wasn't you, it was some business guy. You had to ask your parents to use the home phone. And in a lot of places, the home phone cost money, so your parents would say no. I know a lot of British fans who spent a lot of their early time in fandom in the mid to late 80s standing in telephone booths on the corner of the street with money that you had to put in to keep conversing. Young fans look at us now when we tell them that, and they, we actually have to go back and do a full technological explanation of everything we're saying. It's like taking somebody to a Roman dig site, giving them a pile of artifacts and saying, there, that's the history of early fandom. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's an anthropological study now as much as it is an origin myth. But it, it was mostly at the time it was just fun. It was annoying because it took me so long. It took me so many meetings, so many knocks on doors, so many letters, so many wasted journeys. But eventually I got to publish that first book. And having started, I thought, well, okay, now, now everybody knows how amazing this stuff is. Now it's becoming more available, you know, on video. Now people are talking about it. Other people that are better qualified than I am, that actually read and write decent Japanese, will start to write these books. And you know what? Nobody did. It was quite a few years before anybody else wrote an anime book, so I just kept doing it. So I want to also kind of give some context as to the perception of anime at this time for, again, people who were not there. And again, this is, this is England in the... 80s and 90s and we're full in the period of the video nasties and uh sort of this sort of being up in arms about the media that the youth are consuming and now Akira has just come out and everyone is kind of losing their minds over it. everyone who's kind of in the know is uh what was it like to be a fan at that time period where the perception of anime was either it is kid stuff and it's not worth paying attention to critically or it is hyper-violent, orgiastic nonsense that is going to ruin the youth of our nation. It's interesting that you should say that because we actually had questions asked in the Houses of Parliament in Britain by our members of Parliament, our elected representatives, about Japanese animation. There was a serious concern that this would corrupt the youth of Britain totally and lead to them all becoming drug... I mean, remember, this is 15 years after punk, but we were still worried that kids might become drug addled, disaffected, uninterested, not willing to engage with society. Have we learned nothing? You know, we'd had this with the hippies, we'd had this with the punks, and now we had it with anime. And there was a real atmosphere around it, which was, of course, deliberately leapt upon by Island World Communications, who had set up a manga video label, the, the, the origins of present day manga video, who were deliberately angling the marketing of this material in that direction, choosing 
to market it because they knew that if you tell a 12 year old boy that something is so violent, so disgusting, so radically and emphatically transgressive that he is not allowed to read it, to, to see it because he's under 15, you know that kid is going to move heaven and hell to buy that videotape and to watch that videotape. And the marketing was aimed at. There was a, a technique that Jonathan Clements has talked about in his anime history, and that he's talked about extensively elsewhere, called 15 -ing. And Jonathan was one of the practitioners. Translators were asked to make the language in anime as edgy as possible, even if it was not so in the original. So that our British Board of Film Certification, because we censor all our, our video and film releases, would certify it as only suitable for people over 15. 15 -ing meant taking a perfectly innocent line and turning it into something like, if I can give you an example, and anybody with, with, with sen sensibilities might want to cover their ears at this point, I'm going to rip your head off and shit down your neck. That line does not exist in the Japanese. There is a line that's quite violent, but not like that. But it had to exist in English to ensure a 15 certificate so that the 12-year-olds would want to buy this tape. I think that is mo probably most iconically evident in the 80s Devil Man adaptation in English. I was just about to say, English. I have yeah. the, the Manga UK VHS <laughs> dub, and it is very, uh, not what is in Japanese. <laughs> yes, very, very much so. And of course, at the time, nobody knew this. And it was it was a good bandwagon for um, England home and beauty politicians to jump onto and say how it was un-British and it was corrupting our children. And of course, there was there's still a huge residual racism to anybody Asian right through Britain and America and Europe after the Second World War. We kind of got over the Germans because they married into our royal family, but we never really got over the Asian side of it. There's a really strong racist bent there. And this product being Japanese played into everybody right wing's hands so neatly and so beautifully. That was an awful construction. I do apologize. I should have said into the hands of everybody with a right wing bent so neatly and so beautifully um, that anime got all the negative publicity it could handle. A young friend of mine called Leah Holmes, who's a remarkable British anime scholar, she's just finishing her doctorate, has done quite a bit of work on this. She's got a, a very interesting presentation she does at British conventions around this time period, going into the newspaper records of the time and what was said and what the general mood was. And it's, it's quite fascinating to look back at those times and realize just how hysterical we were about anime that now seems as it as it was intended to seem something to excite young teenage boys and therefore as edgy as a young teenage boy could take it but no edgy i kind of think of that bbc manga presentation that you were actually featured on with jonathan ross which i rewatched the other day in preparation for this and it is very very racist. I love how they play, like, turning Japanese over, like, a montage of, of various 80s technologies, and it's it's like, wow, we really just... We were terrified of Japan in the 80s, both America and England. It was both their media will corrupt our children and they are secretly trying to take over the world with their economic bubble. The the Famicom, the, the anime that they're producing is all just some horrible plot, and it's <laughs> it's so dated and it's almost camp how awful it is in some cases. It is, it is funny that some people's uncles still think that the Nintendo system has a chip in it that will read your mind and <laughs> make you explode. But in a way, it is understandable, because if you think about it, Japan was an empire of its own that Britain and America, working with the other allies, had managed to defeat. But if you look at both of our experiences of empire, Britain's as a dying empire in the past, and America's as a new young empire that wanted to be a lot more imperial than it had been so far, and was starting to lose the economic and scientific clout to do it. Our reaction to this old empire suddenly reviving through what we now call soft power was entirely predictable. Britain and America had no idea how to handle soft power. And we ought to, because we had Shakespeare, the cultural revolution after Elizabeth I, but most of us have forgotten that. You guys hadn't had time 
to learn to adapt to soft power, to learn to do anything but be imperial. And we just freaked, we flipped, we, we completely lost it over Japan finding another way to establish an Asian hegemony in the West. And really, when you think about it, and you look at the anime of today, with extremely well-behaved schoolgirls forming rock bands, what were we flipping over? This is, you know, most, most anime says, hey, kids, go to school, be cooperative, be nice, and go out with the guy next door. Exactly what American parents want their children to do. It's... Yeah. Kaon is ru ruining the youth of the West. <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's giving them all terrible ideas about making friends and being cooperative and doing well in school. It's horrible. You brought up the the sort of backlash to anime in Great Britain, so I'm thinking, and that made me think. You know, what was there a similar thing going on, or or not a similar thing going on in places where anime and manga were more entrenched, like France, Spain, Italy? Do you can you could you speak to their take on that? Like, why didn't the same things happen, or did they? Because they'd already had them. The same thing had happened in the seventies in France. So it, it happened already, but just earlier. And, and, and also quieter because there wasn't, technology has escalated the ability to shout more than almost anything else. The ability to move and the ability to shout. Now with the internet, we could shout and send it around the world. However small and insignificant we are, however trivial our cause, if we just find the way to punch the right buttons, our shout can be heard in outer space. But back then, your shout could only be heard as far as your language and your technological reach would run. So at the 70s in France, there was a big outrage. And remember, the French do outrage very well. They're a nation of philosophers. Nobody can do outrage better than France can do outrage. Um, one of their foremost young academics then was a woman called Ségolène Royale who actually came up against Emmanuel Macron for the presidency of France and, and did very well in the poll insofar as France is ever likely to elect a woman, which is probably further off than America electing a woman. Um, so she could have been president of France, but at this time she was a young academic and she wrote a paper about the terrible negative effects of um, Japanese animation and babysitting television in general, but focusing on Japanese animation. Now, she was building on an earlier paper by an academic called Lilian Lurkat, L-U-R-C-A-T, which uh, the title translates as five years old and left alone with Goldorak, the young child in Japanese animation. And it was talking about the increasing habit of a changing society in France where women since the war had been more likely to work less likely to be at home with their children till they were grown up, therefore more likely to have their child being a latchkey child and coming in from school and sitting down with the TV and a, a, an easily available cold snack to entertain themselves till mom and pop got back from work, all alone with these violent Japanese cartoons. And Lillian Lurkat's paper caused a stir, and Segalin Royale built on that with a book called in translation The Discontent of the Baby Zappers which essentially said, leave your kid alone with the remote control and control of the TV, and you are breeding a monster. On the other hand, people in France had these programs on Saturday morning TV. They could check them out themselves. They could see what their kids were seeing. Most French parents don't seem to have been that freaked out by it. Right across France and in Belgium, I know a lot of people who were three, four, five years old in the 80s, early 90s, who were having perfectly normal childhoods with their parents not freaking out. So there was a certain amount of that in France, a certain amount of that probably in Spain, although I can't speak to Spain, certainly some of that in Belgium. But because the material was widespread on TV and widespread in ordinary bookstores, ordinary newsagent shops, just translated everywhere in Sunday papers, in little bound volumes, 
there wasn't the same kind of hysteria as when it was concentrated in a youth culture format like niche video. So there was hysteria, there was annoyance, but it couldn't go quite so far because of the timing at which it occurred. And also it was diluted by the presence of anime and manga at ordinary everyday social levels, which we didn't have in Britain and America. And I think that was that was an interesting thing in itself. When you speak about France, it reminds me of that fact I love that Gona Guys, I think it's Grindizer, was the most watched program in France for like a week straight. And that's because there was only two channels and the other channel was an economic report. And, and also it was the summer holidays. When, when, when it started on French TV, it was the summer holidays. And, you know, kids home from school, if the weather's good, great. You go out on your bike, you see your friends, you play football, whatever. If the weather's terrible... You hang out in somebody's house and you watch TV and suddenly there's this really cool giant robot show. It was it was it was interesting actually. The reason that it got on in the summer holidays is that a young programmer at the French national TV station wanted to show it, but his boss thought it was too edgy and too risky. So he had to wait and put it on when his boss went on leave in the summer. Most French people at that time who were fairly high up in business took a month off and went to the south of France or something nice like that with their families. And that was how Rendizer got onto French TV. So moving on from your fandom history and fandom in the UK and America in the 80s, uh, you have done quite a lot of scholarly writing on anime to the point that you have written a book on Osamu Tezuka which has gotten you the label of his biographer in Japan and has been translated into Japanese and I believe Korean and Chinese as well. And, and, and Spanish and, and, and Italian. And you've also written a similar biography of Hayao Miyazaki, where you actually got to sit down and interview him and other people at Studio Ghibli. Um, you have done quite a lot. Again, if you are a person who is seriously looking into anime as an academic subject, you probably will at some point have to reference something that Helen has written in her career. Given that you have been doing anime as a scholarly topic for so long, what are the sort of trends in anime academia that you have seen and what you kind of see as being the future of anime academia? Oh, I'm not sure anyone, even with a crystal ball, could predict that. Because one of the things that's happening in academia at the moment, as anywhere else, is that budgets are under pressure as never before. I mean, serious scholarly study of anime in Japan didn't really start to happen until the 90s because Japanese colleges and universities wouldn't give funding for it. Um, really serious <coughs> study of anime in Britain and America started up around the same time. In France, it's probably around the same time, because there was, there was a conjunction of a more flexible, more open attitude to popular culture in universities and the availability of funding. But now, as society as a whole, is kind of veering more towards the right, veering more towards caution. The pandemic has imposed massive costs that, that public services never expected to have to carry. We really can't call much about academia for the next four or five years, I think. Everybody is going to be in a very straightened circumstance. But let's, let's go long term. Let's look in a, a, a more utopian manner, as if we could. There are two things that I have seen during the last 20 years that have begun to change and that seem to me to be really positive shifts. One is that because, to begin with, anime and manga studies was not a very well-regarded or serious field for anyone, for a linguist, for an anthropologist, for a, a, a literature student, for anyone, women have been able to make more inroads. We get in more easily to areas men despise we get in more easily to areas that are less well paid. That is unfortunate, but it is the truth. And some great female scholars have taken full advantage of that with anime and manga, whether crossing over from other areas, whether um, coming in 
originally as an anime manga scholar, female scholars have picked this up and run with it. I mean, look at this Nicole Rusmanier, the curator of the British Museum's fabulous manga exhibition last year. Her doctoral thesis was Kaki Mon Porcelain. That's about as far from anime and manga as you can imagine until you look at the analysis of images and the technique of craft and how it ties into everyday life. And then, of course, a Kaki Mon Porcelain scholar is perfectly positioned to study anime and manga, obviously. Um, but but the, the opportunity for women to gain a toehold has been remarkable and women are fighting to hang on to that now. The other thing that's been interesting has been how the ubiquity of English language versions of anime has enabled many monoglot scholars or scholars with shaky mm -hmm. language skills like me, and I'm speaking here with deep gratitude, to explore anime and manga. But the unfortunate thing is that you know, when you start out with, with, with pidgin Japanese, which I have, but lots of determination, two things happen. You become very familiar with search engines and dictionaries, and you make a lot of better qualified friends, and you exploit them shamelessly. And th <laughs> this has been one of the great blessings of my career, that I have had people that I can check my translations with, that I can talk to, that I can cover my, cover my ass with, in the, in the British phrase. But some scholars don't want to risk that. And so they have stuck purely with the English language versions in studying. And I think that has limited Anglophone anime and manga studies more than necessary. Because, of course, even now, with the vast amount of material that's begun to come out, we still know only a fairly small slice of anime and manga. Very little older material, relatively, has still appeared. And so we are still ignorant of the foundation stones of about two thirds of our discipline. Imagine if you were studying classical civilization today, but you had to wipe the names of two thirds of both major and minor Greek and Roman authors off the syllabus. How would you deal with that? We're studying anime and manga with one hand tied behind their back. I know very serious manga scholars whose work I respect massively, who do not know Chieko Hosokawa's key work, Ukinomonsho, Seal of the King, which is one of the great romantic manga of world history, and is also the longest running manga anywhere. And, and yet scholars don't know it because it's never appeared in English. Actually, it would also, it would be a gift to Netflix it would be such a gift to Netflix. Game of Thrones has nothing on Ukinomonsha. It's fabulous. Go out and read it now, whatever happens. But, you know, it, it's so those two things, the lack of willingness to adventure into unexplored territory has restricted scholarship, Anglophone scholarship, and has made its work, although valuable, limited. And the ability of women to get in there and do work and show that they can do work has been an enormous blessing. So it's, it's a balance, pros and cons, looking back. Now, looking forward, what I want to see is more women working in this field, more non-gendered people working in this field, more multi-gendered people working in this field more people bringing different perspectives. I want to see African anime scholars as well as black American anime scholars. I want to see more and more and more non-Japanese Asian manga scholars, more and more scholars who can tie together the marvels of K-pop and Japanese animation and Japanese manga and how Korean culture is cross-fertilizing once again after a long history of doing so. We have the opportunity now with the communications tools that we have and the scholarly tools that we have, both, both online and in person, to build a view of culture that is truly inclusive, truly worldwide, truly all-embracing, using anime and manga as a springboard and I think if we neglect that opportunity, we are betraying the future. So what I hope to see when you are talking to me on my 100th birthday or when someone else podcasting 50 years in the future to scholars who are just starting out now, 
what I hope they will say is, yep, anime and manga really turned out to be a bridge to world culture without diluting, without making culture homogenous, without doing an Americanized version of manga, without doing films for a modern Western audience. Anime and manga, as a gift from Japan to the world, have been able to meld with all these other wonderful Asian and African and European cultural forms and have been able to truly radicalize culture. That's what I'd like to see. That's what I think we could do if scholars just keep doing it and keep on their pace. Uh, last week I was listening to an interview that you did on the wonderful Anime World Order podcast, oh, probably about gosh, a decade I love ago. Those guys. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're wonderful. wonderful. We've we've had a chance to run into uh, Daryl and Gerald at conventions a couple of times uh, over the last couple of years, and they're very very great guys. So if they're listening, shout out to you guys. But anyway, something you mentioned on um, on that show back in I believe it was like 2008 or so is about how you were wanting there to be more more shared scholarship between Japan and the English speaking audience in the academic world has there been any movement on that since then do you think it's better now it certainly is there's, there's never been there's never been the amount of movement i would like to see because i always want it all and i want it now that's you know we 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 have no patience but um if you look at journals and English language publications, more and more of them are embracing Japanese scholars and publishing the work alongside. More and more academic institutions that work on anime and manga Japanese culture are including scholars from Japan and across Asia. Um, the University of East Anglia here in, in Norwich in England has some wonderful Japanese and Asian scholars working alongside other scholars. And it enriches everybody so much when you can actually see that happening. And linguistic barriers are now, thankfully, now, now that we have better technology, not as serious as they were in the past. But the other wonderful thing is that um, technological barriers are enabling scholars to speak without having to travel. And of course, that has been a great blessing for the pandemic. But before this pandemic, um, back at the end of last year, I was in Norwich for a seminar day at the University of East Anglia and three scholars spoke from one from Azerbaijan one from somewhere in Russia I forget where the third was from but from from totally different parts of the world scholars who could not get funding to travel might not have even been able to get permission to travel depending on the regime they were working under at the time or their university's quotas or whatever but could take full part with other scholars in an academic symposium because they could get online and Skype it. It was that simple. So now we have this wonderful opportunity that will maybe work to counteract a little bit the idea that it's expensive to do a scholarship because you have to go all over the world and your university won't necessarily fund you to do all those trips. There is absolutely no reason now why you can't attend any symposium at any level at all as long as you can Skype it. So I think, I think we have an opportunity now to do a great deal more than we have done. And it's beginning to, to bear fruit. We're beginning to see some really exciting collaborations and cross-fertilizations between young scholars in Asia and, and, and in the West. I would like to see more African scholars come in on this, but I understand that anime might not be a primary interest and there might be other areas at the moment like science fiction, which is enjoying a huge resurgence of African energy and black British and black American energy. Um, and sometimes it happens, I think, that, that a particular culture, for reasons that don't always become apparent until a long time later, suddenly blossoms in one area. It's like water flows wherever it can get out. 
water will flow anywhere that it can find an outlet and it will come out in a form that wasn't necessarily the form it went in as. And in the same way, I think it will be very exciting when we start getting input from all the new Arab, North African and Gulf World fans that we're seeing coming up along the lines. It will be great when we get more input from those fans in scholarly areas. Africa, I'm sure, will have its contribution to make to anime, but maybe right now, African fans are so absorbed in making comics and in making science fiction that their commitment to anime will come in a bit later. I don't know enough about the, the world of anime fandom in Africa to really speak on it, but my impression is that apart from the um, north of Africa and the Gulf world, there's still a way for, to go for anime to penetrate down there. Same with India. Huge subcontinent, fabulous array of cultures, fans with wonderful energy and enthusiasm in comics and in science fiction haven't seen an awful lot there about anime fandom although they are watching anime and they are indeed localizing much anime we have so much still to do but the exciting thing for this new century is going to be that talking in 50 years time scholars are going i hope to be talking about the indian and the african input to anime uh in ways now that we're talking excitedly about the other Asian input to anime and manga. You probably caught it, but um, ANN did a profile of anime fandom in Zambia, I think last week or so. And uh, that was really fascinating. On my list. Yeah, it's, a, it's not a super long article. It's kind of just a profile, but I, I thought it was extremely fascinating to see that, that, um, that fandom being profiled um, and shown off in a way that you know we don't we don't really see very much because it's still blossoming, like you said. And of course, also, although fans across Africa do have access to modern technological tools, many of them are at an economic level where it's difficult for them to get that access. The fact that well-to-do people in Zambia can um, Skype doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to be able to Skype regularly because they have to keep their phone charged and they have to keep mm -hmm. credit on their phone and that's not always possible. Things that we take for granted because we don't think we're rich and we are ridiculously rich. We're not as ridiculously rich as ridiculously rich people, obviously, and they've got richer over the past few years. In fact, over this pandemic, I was reading something disgraceful, like the world's 10 richest billionaires have made something like 500 million extra each i can't remember the figures but some absurd extra amount of money out of the pandemic excuse me while i vomit <laughs> yeah exactly well actually no it's great that people make that kind of money what isn't great is that they keep it and use it to make themselves richer if i right. had 500 million quid i'd go to africa now and yeah. i wouldn't come back with a penny but you know it's 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 not does it's the willing it's the willingness to invest only in what makes them money rather to, than to invest in wonderful things for other countries that need it or for people in our own countries that need it. That's what makes a rich person disgusting. It's not mm -hmm. having money. It's having money and being greedy with it. Andrew Carnegie, the American millionaire, came to my country and built libraries all over it for poor people. The mm -hmm. Carnegie Library is still running in Britain 120 years later, and communities go into them every day and can get access to books because Andrew Carnegie didn't keep his money, he did good with it. That's what we want to see. Right. And that's what would enable more fan access. But, you know, Africa Africa is an astonishing continent, and I am always astounded at the, the energy that keeps coming out of there, because, of course, humanity came out of Africa, as we know. Mm -hmm. But the energy, the creativity that keeps coming out of there, and the amount of, again, going back to racism, the amount of time and energy that colonizing forces, white forces, have devoted to pretending that Africa doesn't have that energy, doesn't have that creative ability, is just ridiculous. What we should be doing is embracing it and say, hey, first off, we're really sorry that we have treated you so badly through the centuries and we want to make amends. Second off, how about you tell us how we can work with you to make the world a better place? And just go with it and be led for once. Britain has had to give up leading the world. And to look at the history of my country in the past 150 years, we haven't liked it. And it's sucked. <laughs> and it's been painful. Personally, I was born at the end of that period, so it doesn't affect me in a, a negative way. 
I think it's great. You guys have had much less time to lead the world and now you're having to give it up too and it's hurting you and it's horrible. And I do feel for America because it seems to me that at the moment, and this is, this is my ignorant Britisher speaking, so feel free to tell me I'm wrong, but it seems to me that at the moment America is dealing with two enormous traumas that every colonizing force has to deal with. You're dealing with the terrible wrongs still being done to the Aboriginal peoples of your land, of their land, to the First Nations. And you're dealing with the appalling wrongs still being done to the descendants of slaves because you're using your prison system to make them still be free labor. And that's yeah. a psychic wound. That's an injury on such a deep karmic level that no one, no nation can deal with guilt at that level and not be damaged. And the only way for you to give up the guilt is to own it and carry it and apologize for it and make it right. And Britain, as I say, has, has had that. And we were still paying reparations to our former slave owners till 2015. We gave them all compensation for the slaves that were freed in Britain. But at least we can think we'd stick them straight back into prison so we could carry on exploiting their labor. Mm -hmm. we're, our hands are not clean and we have a long way to go to apologize and to make it right. But you yeah. guys, it's so much worse for you. And I, I love all of you and I feel so sad for you, but you absolutely must halt the process of genocide against Native American and black peoples for your own sakes. Mm -hmm. and, and that will enable America to become the fabulous country that is waiting there inside this chrysalis of history and hate and to spread your wings and, and be something glorious for the world. And I, I think, you know, for all of us, Africa was our source of life. I think Africa can be a great source of healing in the world. But first of all, we have to regularize our own relationship with Africa and acknowledge our own shortcomings. And in Britain's case, obviously with India, because you, you guys, your hands are clean in India. Us, they are so not. And Asia. I mean, we treated China like shit. All of us treated Japan like shit when we first invaded Japan. And, you know, it, it's, it's, you cannot think about building bridges through culture while you're still building them over chasms of injustice and hate. And that's a task for scholars as well. We have to find ways of helping culture to bring people to realize the necessity for asking and accepting forgiveness. That's, that's a big job for anime and manga to do, but I think we can contribute to it. So you, you've talked a lot about what you think is the sort of future for anime scholarship, and I think it is important to talk about confronting colonialism and racism using even something like the study of popular media. Um, how, what is your advice for people then who are getting into uh, anime as an academic subject? Like, What is your advice for people who may be graduate students already, like me in Austin, or who may be looking into higher education, or who might be just starting at university. Like, what, what do you think is the best advice you can offer for people like that? Some time ago, in fact, many years ago now, because I, I'm, I, I, I'll wind back a bit. Um, about 15 years ago, I met a 15-year-old guy at a convention. Not uncommon. I'd met him a few years before at 12, and he was a really keen artist and he showed me his art and he asked for advice and he asked what he should do. And I met him again at 15, ferociously bright, about to start a foundation course in fine art that would lead him to a college at 16 and on to a degree course. And he said, I've talked to the, 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 the foundation course tutor and he absolutely hates manga style and he absolutely hates anime. 
And he said, I will never get anywhere doing this and I, I can't do that work on my course. What shall I do? And I said, okay, you want to do this course? He said, yes. You want to do a degree because it's not the only route? Yes. You don't just want to do a degree because your parents want you to do a good degree. He said, no, I, I can see the advantages. Okay. Be pragmatic. Nobody can stop you doing the work you want to do on your own time. But what you've got to learn to do is perform as they wish you to perform on the course's time. You've definitely got the skill and the talent to learn to do everything they want you to do. So be a circus pony for this foundation course and jump through their hoops and jump through their hoops better than any other circus pony they've got. And at the end of that time, you will emerge drawing better with a better understanding of artistic principles and therefore able to bring that to your anime and manga. And in the future, any time that somebody says to you, this stuff is rubbish, be pragmatic. Do the things that they want to teach you and then produce the stuff that they said was rubbish done to such a standard that they cannot argue. Win your arguments by doing everything they want to do superbly and then doing what you want to do superbly. And he said, I don't know if I could do that. I said, okay, I know it's really, really tough. It's very hard when you know something is good to be told it's rubbish. But what you need to do is get into a position where your voice carries weight. So that's what I would advise. And you can write to me anytime. You can call me. You can come and talk to me at conventions. I'm always happy to help. But go away and grit your teeth and learn to be the best conventional artist you can possibly be. And your anime and manga will improve massively at the same time. Two years ago, I ran into him on the street. I didn't recognize him because, you know, 15 to almost 30 guys change. He recognized me because there's less change in a woman when she's older. And I said, how are you? And he said, great. I worked in a major design studio for a long time after graduating, and I've just set up my own studio. And I said, how, how's your private art going? He said, absolutely fantastic. I've got a private practice. I do commissions for people. I said, and how did you find integrating anime and manga into your practice? He said, you know, you are absolutely right. Ten years after I, st I wanted to do it, it became easy. Everybody wanted the stuff, and there I was, able to do it with all the skills that they needed. And that just made me so happy. So that's the advice. That's a long-winded story to say the advice I would give to any student first, any student of anime and manga, be pragmatic. If you are going to be a professional academic, you know whatever country you're doing it in, whatever system you're doing it in, there will be hoops you have to jump to. There will be people you have to please. There will be unreasonable requests you have to meet. Eat it. Because if you choose this path, you choose it in the knowledge that that will happen. And be pragmatic. Learn to do all the performative stuff that impresses your particular system very, very well. And with absolute integrity. Also, study what you want to study find ways to bring it in find ways to show its value treat it as added value not the conventional stuff you're making me study is wrong but the conventional stuff you're making me study has a great platform on which i can expand using this stuff i'm bringing in from outside learn the buzzwords that push the buttons multicultural is a great buzzword it's a great principle but it's also a buzzword in most institutions now Look for ways that anime and manga support the current academic trends and bring them in. Maybe not exclusively at first, but bring them in. Hide in plain sight. Become water. Become a ninja. If you have to do it by stealth, do it by stealth. But that way, you will get to a position in the academic establishment where you will have respect and integrity and you can make the points you want to make. So build your platform. Build your platform well. Don't neglect conventional tools. They've served generations of academics. But don't allow yourself to be wiped out. 
that's the first thing pragmatism become water then become forest forest is a wonderful concept forest isn't an object it's an ecosystem you will exist as a scholar in a massive ecosystem of technology and colleagues and languages and different cultures and access learn to use them all as part of your integrated entire practice you may not have great gifts in languages i don't you may not feel qualified to study outside your own native language i don't but do it anyway because first of all you might find that irritating as the process is it's also quite fun i do and it will bring you richness that you never imagined and things that you can't find in your own language be a bird in the forest and cultivate your alliances make friends deal fairly with people give before you ask to get and you'll get back more than you ever imagined so all that richness of the ecosystem around you learn to be part of it contributing and taking back and finally be a mountain be immovable don't be inflexible mountains are very flexible they move all the time but never give an inch you know that what you're doing is worthy of respect you know that the way you're doing it has integrity never allow anyone to suggest otherwise don't get into a fight about it but the moment somebody criticizes your field say something along the lines of i hear what you're saying but i think i will be able to demonstrate that this is really valid i hear what you're saying but i would really like the opportunity to show you why that might not be the right opinion at the moment I hear what you're saying but this allows me to work in ways that reach many many more people many people who might not otherwise understand or appreciate this particular scholarly aspect have integrity and you can't have integrity without self respect and those three things being pragmatic building an inclusive community and giving and getting and having the self respect of your own integrity will get you maybe not to the top in academia because luck is a large proportion of anything but they will get you in a position where you will deserve to be lucky and where you can take advantage of any luck that comes your way and honestly thinking of the scholars that i esteem the most the scholars that i respect the most they are always giving they are always affirmative they are always positive they are always willing to help but they always stand by their core beliefs and that speaks to me of someone i want to learn from i want my gurus to be worthy to be my gurus because damn i deserve good gurus and that's the best way to get good gurus is by being worthy of a good guru So now we have a few questions from listeners that we're going to give to Helen to answer. And the first one is from uh, Tobias, who is not a listener. He's also on this podcast. Um, what is the one anime property you're sad to never see take off in the States? Or, I suppose, in the UK as well? So many, but Legend of Galactic Heroes, which has had a large chunk of my heart for many, many years. And Rose of Versailles. Rose of Versailles I think is an anime whose time may have gone in the eyes of many because its technology is old school and 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 very old school but it's a story that has literally everything it has love passion intrigue cross dressing great outfits revolution it's it's one of the most radical manga ever written and that's reflected in the anime so I would love to see Rosa Versailles take off and one of my one of my little things is every now and then I go on Twitter and I say hey Netflix make this and they ignore me <laughs> but hey Netflix make Rosa Versailles it will be a career maker for young actors and actresses and it's a fabulous fabulous story now i'm just thinking about that Jock de me uh lady oscar adaptation that he did and i had a friend watch it recently he's like oh this is terrible i'm like look at shocked me it's it's going to be a 50/50 shot you know yes. everybody in that movie was either a european bit part actor or a british soap star so 
And, I mean, Rose of Versailles did have its manga re-released. I think, I forget who did it. I, I want to say it was Seven Seas who did the it's big... It's Udon. Udon. Oh, they did? And they did the big, beautiful, leather-bound... Uh, they're doing the big, chunky omnibuses, and I've been meaning to get that. Um, I'm hoping that with this, like, retro crush and all of this, like... It kind of annoys me that older anime is just an aesthetic thing now, but I'm hoping that that might be the thing that will slowly get people to look beyond stuff that was made pre-2000 because i know i still kind of go on twitter it's like hey kids do we still like lum is she still she's still a thing and like yeah i totally get that and a lot of my favorite anime have also never really had any sort of impact in the anglophone world so um one day one day gatter man will get its due one day so as you all listeners know, Basil from the Awesome Cast always offers up a wonderful plethora of questions, but we only have so much time, so I'm just going to pick out a few of these here and say, um, I guess I'm going to abbreviate this to be about not fandom, but maybe conventions specifically. So what are some things about conventions in the days of yore that you really miss, and what are some things about conventions today that you really enjoy? Well, I just love conventions. I went to my first convention in 1974. It was a science fiction convention. It was my first chance to do cosplay in public, although it wasn't called cosplay then, of course. And I just had a whale of a time. It was fantastic. One of the things that I miss about conventions of yore is that even American conventions in their earlier days were much more intimate, much smaller. And so you could go, for example, I went to Anime East, uh, Anime America, and... Uh, Anime Expo in 1994, when they were one city apart, and I was actually able to talk to almost everybody at both conventions. Now, you go to Acon now and try to talk to everybody at Acon, you couldn't even take in everybody at Acon in the weekend. There are like 30,000 people. How do you deal with that? So I miss the intimacy of small cons. I miss the fact that you could walk into a bar and meet one of the guests and just be having a drink, you know, not have them policed off or, or sectioned away behind security, but just be sitting together like two human beings having a chat. Um, I miss the intimacy in the green rooms when people used to mingle a lot more than, than, than they do now. But that was then and anime has got bigger and I'm really grateful for that. What happens now is that big conventions break down to a series of mini conventions inside each big convention there'll be eight or ten or a hundred small conventions going on in the games room in the doll room in the in in all sorts of corners and private groups making their own convention and so you still get that mini convention it's just that unless you happen to know that group you don't hook into it which i think is sad but the best thing about conventions now is the absolute epic banquet laid on for you of so many things that you want to be in five places at once. It's, you know, that frustration of reading the comic book on, on the way home as, as you drive or plane or train back to wherever you came from and say, oh, my God, I saw this and it was great, but I missed this that was all at the same time and this that was all at the same time. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing. But for me, because I, I go to conventions as, as a guest, I go to conventions for work. And that means I'm in a very privileged position in that I get to avail myself of whatever facilities the con makes for guests hanging out together, which is usually some kind of green room. And because you're all on downtime there and you're all just chatting and you're all just relaxing, it's a wonderful opportunity to meet and get close in human terms to people that you'd normally go, wow, monkey punch. <laughs> wow. It's, I mean, for me, Meeting the the American actors is wonderful, and I love meeting the American actors because all I respect all actors so much. They 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 sign up to get rejected for a living over and over and over and over again, and when any of them don't get rejected, they are so sweet and so grateful. All performers are like that, I find, and 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 I've met very few really nasty, arrogant, big headed actors, and so many that are still. How did I ever get here? How did I get this lucky? And that's 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 lovely and pure. But you know, when, when you're sitting next to somebody, and Fred Schultz sidles up to you and says, um, "Monkey Punch wanted to have a chat," and then Fred sits behind you and seamlessly translates between the two of you, so that it's almost as if you and Monkey Punch were talking to each other without a language barrier. 
or when somebody wonderful like Liza Wilkerson, whom I never have met but for conventions, comes up and gives you all the energy of modern day Tokyo, or when you sit down with a scholar like Crispin Freeman and discover that you and he have got so many shared interests in how story works. And how... Crispin, I know most people know him as a voice actor, but Crispin is a scholar that I respect enormously because of his work in mythology. Or you run into somebody like Ada Palmer, who is one of my academic gods, and just have so much fun sitting around together, shooting the breeze, talking about projects. That's the best bit at conventions, I think, for, for everybody, whether you're a guest or not. The thing with a convention is that it gives you the chance to find people that are totally on your wavelength. But it also gives you the chance to find people that are just enough off your wavelength that it will be the most exciting thing you've ever encountered, a challenge and a change. And that, you know, that to me is great. No, I love that. And I, I, I find that is in some ways what I find most rewarding about conventions. Like f for us, you know, we go to a few per year and it's easy mm -hmm. to kind of feel a little uh, overwhelmed. Um, overwhelmed a little bit burnt out uh in in some ways because we've been doing it for a while but um but but also like remembering that there are so many opportunities to learn different things and for you to be able to teach people different things so that they can come to you and have a reaction that you've never seen before like that's one of the great things like that i do at, at my panels is um you know, kind of, the panel kind of can stay the same from iteration to iteration. I may change a little bit, but I always get different reactions from people, and their reactions help me to be a better panelist. Um, and and I, I I love that. I love feeding off of that energy. I love uh, I love taking in that opportunity to be critiqued or complimented, whichever it may be. Um, and try and use that as a as an opportunity to do new things with 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 the content that I'm presenting. Oh, so much that I mean, I I, I did a panel last year on the manga Beatles because I'm I'm a huge Beatles fan. Of course, I grew up and went to school in Liverpool. How could I not be? Um, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to talk about the the relationships between the Beatles, particularly in their their Hamburg and pre Hamburg years, and how I thought that was replicated in the post-war manga era and who I thought were the manga Beatles. And I did that at four conventions last year and uh, one place in England. And each time the audiences gave me so much in terms of perspectives on the Beatles. Um, what, what one convention, a father and his daughter attended together. And her dad was about my age and an old Beatles fan. And she'd kind of been put off the Beatles while she was young because her dad was so into them and she'd done other things and then come back to them. And the two of them had such a wonderful take on a lot of different bits of Beatlemania that I hadn't thought of before and a lot of different aspects of the music that I hadn't thought of before. You just you just gain so much. Mm -hmm. That gives me hope for my David Bowie and anime panel I one day will write. <laughs> did you know Leiji Matsumoto did a manga on David Bowie? I did not know that. Matsumoto is a huge music fan, massive music fan, and he did a stack of manga for a Japanese magazine called Rekopau. And among them, alongside lots of stuff on classical music, which is one of his great loves, David Bowie, I think there's Bob Dylan, I think there might even be a John Lennon. Wow. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> Hopefully somebody has translated it. <laughs> or well, at least we, the images Nobody has somewhere. translated it, but we do have the citation and the year in the um, index of our Matsumoto book was coming out from McFarland later this year, so you'll be able to find it there. Good. Um, pre-order that... now. <laughs> pre-order now. Yeah, well, please pre-order now. Actually, just let, me say, just let me say one thing, although I've been doing nothing but talk. Pre-order books, please, particularly mm -hmm. now in, in this situation that we're in, because when you pre-order a book, you say to a publisher that you're willing to put money into that book, and it means the publishers print more, and so the authors have the opportunity to, to sell more books and make more books. Pre-ordering yes. is one of the best ways you can support an author and a publisher 
and a bookstore right now. So please pre-order books. Mm -hmm. Especially now important. that we're in a pandemic, there are no conventions. What else are you going to do? You better be, as we at Third Impact <laughs> Anime say all the time, go outside and read a book. very passionate about, about making sure that the anime community is a very inclusive place and one thing you talk about and we kind of touched on this in the 80s the the over focus on the adolescent male market that anime in many ways does sort of especially in western fan communities narrow itself to a male perspective and now we are kind of fortunately entering a place where uh shoujo manga female fans um, a more diverse range of fans are kind of having a voice and being represented, but you've also talked a lot about the misogyny that has, in a way, gotten worse thanks to the internet, and I was wondering if you had any interest in touching on that at all. Well, it's interesting you, say, you should say that. The young British scholar Leah Holmes, whom I mentioned earlier, was one of a group of young women that I met when we founded Anime UK magazine back in the early 90s. Um, she and a group of other girls put together a, a, a fan group called Anime Babes, they were all, I think they were all under 15 or 16 at the time. They were all girls, they were all feisty and passionate, and they wanted a group that said, yeah, we, we are into anime, girls can be into anime, and this is a group for girls who want to be into anime. And yes, we're all babes, we're all hot, we're all terrific, but we're more than that, so you just shut up and listen to us. They had so much energy, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful to see. They were, they were baby lions, kind of rolling around all over the place and roaring and they were great and all of them have gone on to do remarkable things since then but i i have never seen the point of misogyny because it wastes the energy of 50 percent of the human race i see the desirability of misogyny from the male perspective because if you can get somebody else to be your service animal you never have to grow up i mean peter pan what is that People wait on your hand and foot. You use magic for everything. You're never responsible for yourself. You never take care of yourself. You live a life of complete irresponsibility. That means you never grow as a person and you're never mature enough to make any art that's worth making. And that, in my view, is the one original sin. Never to make anything that's worth making. Um, so, yeah, I am, I've been a committed feminist. I was brought up a committed feminist by an Irish grandmother, Irish aunts, an Irish mother, and a whole posse of nuns. And I believe that I own half the world, and I have a responsibility to own half the world. And in, in anime, it's quite difficult, because sometimes someone will come up and say something smart at a convention, or obviously just be showing off. And on the one hand, you don't want to crush a young plant. That's unkind and unfair. But on the other hand, you can't just sit there and listen to that kind of talk without calling it out so I try and do it gently and with respect but I also try and do it uncompromisingly because look at all that we lose I mean there are so many women who are doing great things in anime great things in manga there are so many mangaka who are astonishing female creators I think where I lose patience is where people can only build themselves up by putting other people down that's very negative and it doesn't matter whether you're hitting on a woman or a gay or a bi or a transgender person or somebody with a different skin color that's just stupid because if you need somebody to be beneath you for you to feel good about yourself you're never going to feel good about yourself ever in this world it's a huge question and it's a worrying question and i wish there was more that we could do about it and for it but I think all we can do, all of us, as, as scholars, as teachers, if we go on to be that, and in writing, and as fans, is to make ourselves into, not barriers, because I don't like barriers, not gatekeepers, because I think gatekeeper is a hideous job, make ourselves into doors to safer and better places, so that young fans who might be facing 
any kind of terror or trauma, know that within fandom, there are sensible, reliable, safe people who will listen to them and not judge them and give them advice if they want advice, but just be there. And that, that I think, I think that might work. Mm-hmm. I think that's what that's that's one sort of uh, approach that I try and really lean into whenever I do panels. Is is uh, it's like I, I've I've read this stuff, I know this stuff, I'm familiar with this stuff, but my panel is not me showing off how much I know. It's it's a sharing exercise about taking what what I have learned and packaging it into a fun 45 minutes or an hour and presenting it to people so that they can appreciate it too, not to just show how big my brain is. Uh, Sully's brain is much bigger than my brain. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad I, you think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's like, be, be a gate, be a gate holder, like hold it open, a door, like you said, instead of a gatekeeper, because no, nobody likes that. That's, that's no fun. Mm, yeah. And when we grow up, maybe we'll get to be the river that carries the boats. Yeah. yeah. Which is the most wonderful thing. Back to your river and forest analogy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I do think that we've become very separated from nature. And one thing that I love about much anime and much manga is that even in a very sparse and sometimes very technological background, you quite often find there's a little bit of nature creepy in there somewhere. There is this sense of groundedness. Of groundedness in the world, which I, I find essential. Uh, so another thing that Basil asks, just real quick. Um, so is there anyone making anime or manga right now that particularly excites you? Oh, so many. So many. Almost too many to, 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 to think of, even. Um, I am becoming more excited by Makoto Shinkai. I know everybody else has been excited by Makoto Shinkai for years. And, and I, I should I should wind that back a bit and say that when I first saw Voices of a Distant Star, I was blown away. I thought this is the rawest, most honest, most devastating analysis of the human heart and teenage love since Romeo and Juliet. And I adore Romeo and Juliet. Um... I got a bit concerned after that, first of all, because everybody started saying Shinkai is the new Hayao Miyazaki. I mean, before the guy had made 12 hours of video, <laughs> he was the new Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> no. For heaven's sake, give him a bit of time. You know, He's the new Makoto Shinkai. Yeah. And also, because for some time after that, it seemed to me that Shinkai was doing the same thing over and over again. Now, there are artists who do that and do it very successfully because they do it differently every time. But it seemed to me for a while in the midpoint of his career that Shinkai was doing the same thing over and over again. I'm becoming more excited about Shinkai now because I think he's begun to move on and show us a bit more of the artist he might be. I'm still not sure of his direction. I'm still not entirely sure of his direction. But, uh, but that's there. But my problem, as as someone who was educated as an historian and a literary critic, is that it's very difficult for me to get excited about anything new. My view is always, let's take the long view and see how they work out. So I see particular new shows or I hear new music and I get very, very thrilled about that and I'm, I'm bouncing up and down with glee about it. But I'm always thinking in the back of my head, about the Anime Encyclopedia Volume 5. What will I be saying in the fifth edition in 15 years' time about this show? What will this person or this team of people have done by then that I will think? And I think that, in a way, it kind of puts a break on on being too enthusiastic about anybody because on the one hand, you're enjoying what they are right now, but on the other hand, you're knowing that what they are right now is a collusion between their particular gift at this moment and your mood at this moment and that that might not endure and that there are numberless shows that I have loved absolutely loved and found looking back on them when I take them apart without the impact of the time the place the people that they don't 
actually have anything to offer beyond that moment. And it's, you know, it's kind of like sex. Sometimes that moment was all there is. And that doesn't mean it wasn't good. It just means that was all there is. And there are anime shows like that. You saw it, you had a great time with those friends at that con or in that place or whatever you were doing, and that is all there was. You're not going to go back to it like I do to Totoro every time and find something new in it. But that's fine, you know. Anime is cheap disposable entertainment, as the late great Bruce Lewis once said. And a great deal of it will be disposable, and most of it was much, much cheaper than it should have been because the budgets are so strained. My task, my self-imposed task and my absolute delight, as Jonathan and I used to say to each other doing the anime, is going through all the shit so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and every now and then you find diamonds, and those diamonds are wonderful. Should, Should that, that be, be the subtitle, subtitle of, the of the anime encyclopedia? encyclopedia? What? Diamonds from shit? I think, yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> Diamond is unbreakable, maybe. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Actually, JoJo fandom is getting more and more exciting by the minute. I it love, is. I love JoJo. Mm -hmm. But I love Jojo fandom because Jojo fandom keeps throwing up all these wonderful new things and ideas and people. And I mean, also, Jojo is a show about idiotic enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how can you not love something that embraces its own outrageous aesthetic as thoroughly as Jojo does? It's like being in a permanent disco. Uh, another participant on this podcast, Ryan, is really asking the tough questions. Helen, what is your favorite color? Purple. Done. Okay, I'm glad we got that cleared. I mean, uh, inquiring minds. It is the color of, of empire. It is the color of passion. It is the color of plums, or some plums, which is a wonderful thing, but I just love purple. Purple is a JoJo color, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is. So, Helen, if people want to support your work, if they if they want to buy your books, uh, how can they do that? Like, how is the way people can connect with the work that you've done best? Right. Now, there, there, are, there are these ways <laughs> apply to all authors, not just to me, and they're, they're very, very important. The first is buy the books. If you can't afford to buy the books, and honestly, if you're an anime fan, you know, I get that there are a lot of calls on, on your money because there are so many things out there tempting your wallet out of your pocket. But if you could afford to spend a small fortune on a collectible figurine, you can buy the books. So buy the books. Buying the books is the best thing you can do for any author because that gives the author money directly. Their publisher gives the author a percentage of every book that sells. If you can't buy the books, one of the wonderful things that we can do in Britain and in certain other countries, and I believe in parts of America, is to take the books out of a public library. If you check a book out of a public library that is a member of the library loan scheme, the author receives a few pennies every time you do that. Now, obviously, this works really well for people like J.K. Rowling who not only sell millions of books but get lots of library loans as well. But what it means is that people who don't have the money to buy the books, you know, students, people on a low income can still give their authors money directly by checking a book out of a public library. And even if your public library is not a member of the library loan schemes, your public library records that the book's been taken out and that affects how the publisher views the author. If a publisher can see that a public library system in, let's say, North Carolina has bought 50 copies of the book a year ago, and is now coming back for another 50 copies, that means that those 50 copies were borrowed so often that they've fallen apart. So the publisher calls up the, the, the library and says, hey, I see that you're buying another 50 copies of our books. And the library says, yeah, we, we, we lent these out. They went out 300 times a book. They came back in rags. 
that means the publisher knows how good the author is. So go to your public library. Support your authors by doing reviews. Doing a review on Amazon, on Goodreads, wherever you choose to review, doesn't cost you anything except some time online, but it makes a big difference to the author. And if you can do a review that's not just, I really liked this, but that says specifically why you liked it and what you got out of it, that's great. And it doesn't matter if the review also offers some criticism. I mean, authors learn from criticism. If you say, I thought this was a really, really terrific book, but I would have liked to see it if it were longer, or I would have liked to see it if it were shorter, or I actually think this is two stories trying to work together, or here in this book about Tezuka, there are so many other stories I can see trying to get out, and I'd like to see books on X, Y, and Z. All that is fantastic. It's all grist to the author's mill, because you would be surprised how many publishers read online reviews. And it's not impossible that if you say of, for example, my fabulous book on Leiji Matsumoto when it comes out, hey, this is a great book on Leiji Matsumoto, but I can see from looking at the book that his wife, Miyako Maki, is also a considerable artist. Some publisher somewhere will make a call and say, book on the artist Miyako Maki, what do you think? So you're helping the authors in future as well as with this, this book. Reviews are our lifeblood. Sales are our lifeblood. Give us as many of those as you can, both if you can, but one or the other is fine, and you will make any author happy. And for me, um, go to libraries, borrow as many of my books as you can, buy as many of my books as you can, obviously. Come and see me when I'm at conventions. Suggest me to wonderful podcasts like this as a guest. Ask conventions to invite me as a guest. Ask your university to invite me over to lecture. I'm not going to go anywhere until there's a serum, but I will very happily do an online lecture. My rates are very reasonable and I'm controversial, but I can keep it clean if I'm asked to, although it's kind of a source for regret if I have to do that. Um, so yeah, there, there are lots of ways. With, with any author at all, any way that increases positive exposure of our books is going to be really, really helpful to us and we appreciate it more than I can say. I will say that in preparation for this podcast, I read through a brief history of manga, and my biggest criti my biggest criticism of it was that it it lived up to its name. It was too brief. I wanted it to be much longer. <laughs> I, I adore that little book. Um, we are, it was actually much longer to begin with. When um, I was commissioned to do the book, it's ninety six spreads now, and I was asked to do it at I think one hundred and twenty eight spreads, um, two picture sheets. And so I wrote it in, at, that, at that length and in that version. And six weeks before I was due to submit my final version, my editor came on to me and said, there's been a major budget cut and we're shrinking everything across the board. I need you to rip out 25% of the book. Oof. So um, talk about killing your darlings. And it was quite complicated in that book because there's a timeline that runs across the bottom of the pages that mm. had to be replanned and recondensed. So it was fun for me. It was fun for the designers. But it is a lovely little book. Its ambitions are far bigger than its size. And I think it does a very good job. And it's, it's one of my books on which I've had the most positive feedback. And it's one where almost everybody says it should be bigger. So, you know, maybe somebody somewhere will ask me to write a not-so-brief history of manga. <laughs> that would be great, and I, I love the little uh, tidbit that you included about um, Shotaro Ishinomori trying to change the way people write the word manga so that it has a more positive connotation, because uh, I, I had never heard that story. I thought that was absolutely fascinating, so thank you for including that. But again, that, that's evidence of how, how good it is to, to go beyond your comfort zone, read widely and deeply. I found that on a Japanese website... And I did my usual shonky translation with, with my dictionaries and, and my, 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 my pathetic reliance on search engines. And then I went to a Japanese speaking friend who is much better than I am and said, this sounds really funky. I'm not sure this is actually accurate. Can you tell me, is my translation way off? Or is this just some wild goose story that this Japanese person is spinning? And they came back and said, no, this is, this is actually covered in several respectable printed sources of the time. It's a real story and your translation was not off at all. But I would not have found it if I hadn't been saying to myself, you know, you really can't just look at sources in languages you read well. You better go to the Japanese and challenge yourself a bit more on that. 
I want to point out a book that actually, because of you, I now have on my to-buy list when I get back to my apartment, and that is, uh, it's a self-published book, but a history of anime before 1919, or is it 1917? I mean, just, just that title, the balls to say, a history of Japanese animation before 1917. It's fabulous, isn't it? Right, I saw the the uh, little presentation that you gave on it, and I was so enthralled. I was like, I have to read this for myself now. Oh, I'm so glad. I mean, Freddie is, he's one of those scholars who is so unassuming. He's um, Canadian-German, uh, works, I think, out of Montreal, uh, quinquilingual, uh, German, obviously, French, which every Canadian has to speak, English, Japanese, and Chinese, possibly wow. something else as well. Um, and just one of those researchers who is like a terrier with a very, very big bone that he's not going to give up till he's unearthed. I mean, that guy read Japanese film magazines going back to the 1900s. He read brochures for magic lantern salespeople going back to the 1830s. Just the depth of the research was staggering. So please do get it. And please do correspond with him when you do, because he's always so appreciative when somebody notices his work. I, I cannot believe that he has had to publish that, self-publish that himself in both German and English. It's insane that a work as important as that has to be self-published. So for all of our listeners, I'll make sure that in our show notes and when we post this interview online that we'll have links to buy all of Helen's books. And is there a pre-order uh, open for the Leiji Matsumoto book yet? I believe McFarlane do have a pre-order open on their website, so go in there and pile in. We'll make sure to link that too. One of the reasons we're so glad to do it with McFarland is that, as you both know as grad students, academic books, if you have to buy them, forget it. They can be crazy. <laughs> yes. But McFarland are at least somewhat more reasonably priced. It's uh, So, you know, it, it's we, we, we all felt, I mean, Darren and I are co-editors, and all the other contributors felt that we, we wanted to make this book as accessible as we could. So when we looked at the different presses that we might have gone to, um, McFarland come out pretty well on that score. You can you can actually access most of their books without losing all your, your, your tuition money for the term or not being able to eat anymore. So we just want to take uh, the time to thank Helen for taking time out of her very busy schedule to talk to us today and, again, give this wealth of knowledge to all of us. If you are a student like me in Austin and you are looking to do anime as a serious academic topic, you will probably, one, again, you will reference her work. It will happen. It's, it's an inevitability. And two, uh, I think all of us should take a lot of her words to heart in how we can make anime scholarship a more inclusive place and a better place going forward, especially mm -hmm. with uh, the way the world is now. If you're listening in the future, uh, hopefully you're in a better future than we are in the present. <laughs> and where can people reach out to you, Helen? Well, the... I'm ashamed to say that I haven't touched my blog in over 15 months, um, but I really have to get my blog back in order. Um, however, on my blog, which is Helen McCarthy, A Face Made for Radio on WordPress, there is an email address which, to which I respond. Um, not always immediately, because I, I do get quite overloaded at times, but there is an email address to which I respond. So please feel free to email me. It's Helen McCarthy Inquiries at hotmail.com. It's on my blog, A Face Made for Radio. Um, I'm very happy to hear from anybody. And also, let me just say that this has been so much fun, you guys, and you have made it such a pleasure to talk to you. Please do yeah. ask more anime scholars on the podcast. Get more anime scholarly opinions and get more people from all over the world engaged with anime talking to each other. And if, if anyone listening would like to invite uh, a, a, an anime scholar that I know on the podcast, on their podcast, I would be very happy to forward invitations. I never give out people's email addresses because obviously that's a bad idea. But if anybody wants an anime scholar to come onto their podcast and doesn't want me, which obviously is your choice, your choice, you have other anime scholars available, but um, I would be very happy to... to listen to what you want and suggest a scholar that you might ask and then forward on an invitation to them because we need to get the conversation around anime scholarship as broad and as inclusive as it is around anime criticism and anime narrative. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being on our show with us and we would love to do more episodes showcasing 
all you know all sides of of the anime fandom experience whether it be fandom artists like our last interview that we did or people that are voice actors or people that work in the industry as well as people that approach the topic from an academic perspective so thank you so much for coming on thank you that was my pleasure all right that was our show for this week thanks again to helen mccarthy for coming on to talk about her work in anime scholarship if you'd like to follow her on twitter her handle is at tweetheart4711 and her website is helenmccarthy.wordpress.com as for me you can follow me austin on twitter at bebop shock and you can follow sully at calvacoon and that's c-a-l-v-a underscore k-u-n and you can follow the podcast overall at T-I underscore anime. You can find the show notes for this episode and others on our website, thirdimpactanime.com. Please consider dropping us a rating or a review on your favorite podcatching website. It really helps us a lot with visibility. And also do consider sharing this episode with a friend, because who isn't looking for a decent anime podcast to distract them while the world is falling apart? On that note, thanks for being here, stay safe out there, wear a mask, and we'll see you next time. Take care.